Fuller, who is our last speaker today, was called to the Bar of Ontario in 1969. Since his call, he has practiced with the firm of Messrs. Fraser Beatty in, Ontario, in Toronto, practicing in wills, trusts, estates, and estate planning. He has been an instructor in the estate planning and administration course of the Bar Admission course from 1970 to 1974, and he headed the course section from 1974 to 1978. David's is a familiar face, both as an organizer and a speaker at programs of the Law Society, the Canadian Tax Foundation, the Wills and Trusts subsection of the Canadian Bar Association. He is also a member of the executive of the Wills and Trusts subsection, and he is a member with Jim Kennedy, who will deliver a lecture tomorrow, of the planning committee for this series, that he should, in addition, have assume the burden of preparing and delivering a paper on modification and termination of trusts, his service above and beyond the call of duty, and it puts us doubly in his debt. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Fuller. Thank you very much, Marv. Ralph Skane, when he commenced his lecture, remarked that he found himself followed by lunch and had no doubt that you would wish him to complete his remarks on time in order that you might go to your lunch. I find myself with the dilemma that I follow five excellent presentations. I'm at the end of the day in the last speaker. There's a complimentary bar when I'm finished. <laughs> and Professor Cullody has remarked to me that in order for you all to receive good value for your registration fees, it is important that I finish not only on time, but preferably by 4 o'clock. <laughs> you have received with your materials a green package or set of materials which I will refer to during the course of my address. Most of the material relates to variation of trusts. In deciding on the topics which I will cover in my lecture, I've had the same difficulty that several of our earlier speakers have had, and that is that my paper in its unfinished version is now up to 40 pages. I'm convinced that I haven't exhausted the possibilities, although I personally am exhausted. And with your indulgence, in order to attempt to present my material in some form that will have any meaning to you, I may make from time to time statements or observations which you find of doubtful authority, you question, Hopefully you will find in my paper some authority for those statements. Now I commence with the, the observation which has already been made that the, most, the trust is a most useful method of holding property. It can be used to protect the interests of those who are perceived by the creator to need protection. It can be used to separate interests and frequently it can be used to save tax. However, I think it important that if a trust is to serve its purpose, it must be capable of amendment, or in some cases, premature termination. I come to this conclusion by looking at some current reasons why trusts created some time ago may need to be varied. We have today an inflation rate approaching 10%. We're told that the prospect of the inflation rate decreasing in the near future is remote. Could a creator of a trust 20 years ago have foreseen such an eventuality? Surely an investment strategy or an investment provision in a trust agreement when inflation 
of 10% was unheard of might today be totally inappropriate and therefore such a trust to serve its purpose may be needing variation. We have seen in Canada continuous income tax changes, particularly since 1971. We've had in Ontario the abolition of gift tax and secession duty. Again, good reasons why trusts need to be capable of variation. Family law reform in Ontario was a further illustration of changes in our society. It appears to me it reflects a different attitude than existed 10 or 20 years ago regarding marriage and regarding the rights of children born outside marriage. Again, I see that as a basis for the necessity of being able to vary trust. It is my purpose today to examine with you the means by which such variations may take place. I think you must commence, and I have commenced in my paper, with an examination of the possibilities which do not require any form of court application. Therefore, I commence with the observation that in some cases, but relatively few, there may be provisions in the trust document itself which provide a means for varying the trust. This is not common in Ontario in tr for trusts which are subject to income tax or in cases where secession duty or gift tax problems are anticipated because the creator's purpose might have been frustrated if there was a power to subsequently amend or revoke the trust. But nevertheless, pension trusts and some special forms of trust do have such powers and I recommend that at any time you are considering this problem, you start by obviously reading the trust agreement to see if there's an express power of variation. Many trusts contain discretionary powers of encroachment which permit the capital to be dealt with premature or prior to the termination of the trust period. I believe that these powers when exercised by trustees may be regarded as a means of varying or amending the trust and perhaps even terminating the trust because it's quite conceivable that the ultimate beneficiaries will change according to whether the encroachment is made at this time or no encroachment is made and the trust is permitted to run its normal course. Powers of encroachment I think raise two interesting questions. Can such a power be used to advance all of the capital of a trust fund and thereby terminate a trust? The second question, can a power of encroachment be used to resettle the capital of a trust fund by transferring it to another trust? Interestingly, the answer to both questions is yes. There is judicial authority for the proposition that all the capital of a trust fund may be advanced to a beneficiary if the words creating the power make it clear that the creator of the trust intended that all the capital might be paid to a beneficiary by means of an encroachment. And, and this is the real problem of course, and if the trustees conclude it is proper to do so. Now, I can envisage special circumstances where this would be an obvious possibility, but in the normal course, it would be a very radical departure from normal trust practice to use a power of encroachment to advance all capital to a single beneficiary to effect a termination of the trust and thereby deny other beneficiaries possible future rights in the capital of the trust and, for that matter, in the income. This leads me to consider the in-between stage, which is can you use the power of encroachment to resettle the capital or some of the capital? As I've stated, the answer appears to be yes. There is judicial authority for the proposition that it may be for the benefit of the objects of the power of encroachment to transfer capital to a new trust. 
Furthermore, it may be possible for this new trust to have beneficiaries other than, or including the, the benefit, of course, the original object of the power, but there may be other beneficiaries as well in the new trust. What I'm thinking of here is the spouse and children or issue of the object of the original power. It also appears that the new trust may have terms and conditions, in other words, provisions relating to its administration and management, which differ from the similar provisions in the former trust. I stress that these decisions all turn on the construction of the trust document and consequently not all powers of encroachment may, may be used in this way. But it does occur to me that this is a very useful possibility. Would it be a suitable approach in circumstances where the variation of trusts act was not available to you because an adult beneficiary refused to consent to a variation or perhaps you're unable to locate an adult beneficiary whose consent was mandatory to the variation? It might be a means of creating a new trust which could have differing investment powers than the original trust. In other words, the new trust could have wider, more flexible investment powers. Looking into the future, we know that in 1992, if certain trusts are not distributed, there will be deemed dispositions. What would happen if you used your power of encroachment to take the capital from the first trust and transfer it to the second trust? Assuming there's a rollover available to you, have you started the time period commencing again with respect to the assets transferred to the new trust? Could this method be used to move a trust from one jurisdiction to another? Could you encroach on an Ontario trust by means of transferring assets from that trust to the Bahamas or some other tax haven? Indeed, it requires a bold trustee, but I suggest to you the possibility exists. I now turn to the rule in Saunders and Vote, which you've all heard of and none of us really understand. Stated very simply, the rule is that the sole adult beneficiary of a trust may vary the trust and that where there are more or there, there is more than a single beneficiary, all the beneficiaries of a trust, if they are adults, may collectively vary the trust. If the sole beneficiary or one of the beneficiaries is incapable, that is, an infant has not been born, is unascertained, then this rule cannot be used to vary a trust. Assuming the rule can be used, what are the limits on its use? For example, can a trust be varied by this means, contrary to the wishes of the trustees. Because remember, to use the rule, the trustees' consent is not required. It's clear that the trust may be terminated without the trustees' consent, but when it comes to merely attempting to vary it without termination, it appears that the beneficiaries cannot do so if they are attempting to control the exercise of the fiduciary power by the trustees unless the trustees consent to the amendment. So there are limitations on the use of the rule. Now, I turn to court applications and I start with one that I became familiar with only a few months ago, which I've referred to as the use of the inherent jurisdiction of the court. I'll describe the nature of the problem later, but my difficulty stated very simply was I, I could not use the Variation of Trust Act to amend 
a trust document because there was an adult beneficiary who was clearly on record saying that she would never agree to any amendment of the sort that was being proposed. It occurred to me that there hadn't always been variation of trust legislation in Canada, although admittedly since I commenced practice that it's so, and therefore there must have been methods prior to the enactment of such legislation to vary trusts. By turning to the text one learns that prior to the enactment of the Variation of Trust Act in England in 1958 and in Ontario in 1959, trusts were frequently varied by means of an application to the court requesting the court to exercise its inherent jurisdiction to sanction a variation of trust. It appears that in proper circumstances the court would exercise its jurisdiction so long as the variation was advantageous for the infant and unborn beneficiaries of the trust. Because the court was exercising its own jurisdiction, not one given to it by statute, it was not an absolute bar to a successful application that one or more of the adult beneficiaries had not consented to the variation or in fact may have even been opposing the variation. Also, the, it would appear to me the fact that you're unable to locate an adult beneficiary whose consent would normally be required would not be an absolute bar to use this form of application to vary a trust. It appears until 1954 the English court was very lenient in its use of its inherent jurisdiction and that to that time there was no need for any statutory method of varying trusts or completing the variation of trusts. However, in 1954, the House of Lords in Chapman and Chapman severely limited the use of the court's inherent jurisdiction. This decision has been adopted in Canada. With the result, I think it fair to say that today the court will only exercise its inherent jurisdiction in three situations. Cases where the settler or testator has directed income be accumulated in, and the court will allow maintenance out of payable out of that income. There is a case in Ontario, 1954 case, Rewrite. As an aside, Rewrite's the most fascinating state because it's created no end of work for solicitors in Ontario. That this is the, the same a state which has been referred to earlier today in which an application was made to sell certain assets of the estate. I'm aware of at least two other unreported applications that have taken place with respect to this estate. It has the beauty that it does not fall into possession until about 2040. <laughs> and I have the privilege of having a, a very modest but nice brief in connection with certain problems in the estate. In other words, it could be my retirement plan. <laughs> no. the, the second case where the court probably will exercise its inherent jurisdiction is where the trust document has restricted the powers of administration and management and the trustees wish to, to enter into a specific transaction which is not authorized by the terms of the trust document. And I'll return to that particular situation in a moment. And finally, it appears that where a dispute exists regarding the interests of the beneficiaries pursuant to the trust document, the court will approve a compromise which has been made or a bargain which has agreed, been agreed upon by the beneficiaries. Before 1954, this last provision was used extensively by the court to vary trusts. And the Chapman decision, I think, 
clearly has limited the use of the compromised jurisdiction to situations where there in fact is a bona fide dispute, not one that's created as a means of bringing the matter forward before the court. But the, the second jurisdiction, the ability to ask the court to authorize a specific business or investment transaction is one that I'm presently involved in. And this is an application which is presently pending before the Manitoba court and will be heard two weeks' time. And I, I bring it to your attention because it's obviously interesting and because you've read about it in the newspapers, I think. As many of you will realize, Thompson Newspapers recently acquired control of FP Publications. And FP, among other things, owns the Toronto Globe and Mail. One of the shareholders of FP was the trustees of the estate of John Sifton, both directly and through a series of trusts and holding companies. The Sifton shares were divided into two distinct classes. Voting shares, which had a very limited par value and therefore did not participate to any great extent in the growth and value of, of FP, and equity shares, which were fully participating but had no votes attached to them. The equity shares were held in a holding company and the trustees of the estate, who are the same people as the trustees of the Intervivals Trust, who are, as you might expect, almost identical to the directors of the various companies, sold these equity shares to Thompson Newspapers over the objection of the deceased widow and after she had unsuccessfully applied to the Manitoba court to restrain the transaction and also had appealed the original decision to the Manitoba Court of Appeal. But the, the interesting question, the reason I bring it forward now, is that the voting shares are held pursuant to Mr. Sifton's will. And his will creates a separate trust fund to hold these shares and states that they are not to be sold, but rather are to be held until his son, Victor, attains 25 years of age. Victor, I believe, is presently 17 years of age. And then the shares are to be transferred to Victor or one or more other persons who are referred to in the will. These shares represent about 23% of the voting interest in FP and have a value based upon the offer by Thompson of about $600,000. I must bring to your attention that the time of Mr. Sifton's death, there was no controlling shareholder in FP. In fact, there were four, well, ultimately there were four groups of shareholders plus a fifth person who had a very small voting interest. At this time, Thompson Newspapers has more than 50% of the voting shares and more than 70% of the equity shares and it is prepared to accept the Sifton shares on the same terms accepted by the other shareholders. The trustees of the estate, knowing that a variation application would be unsuccessful because they could not obtain the widow's consent, her consent being necessary because she's entitled to any income derived from these shares until Victor attains 25, is applying to the Manitoba court asking among other things that the court exercise its inherent jurisdiction to authorize the sale of these shares to, non to Thompson newspapers on the basis that there has been a change in circumstances which could not have been anticipated by the deceased. I look forward to the outcome of this decision. If it is successful, if it is reported, it will create an excellent authority in Ontario for proceeding in other cases by use of the inherent jurisdiction power. What I've said to date is really only an introduction to the major topic I'm covering, which is the variation of trust act. Clearly, I've teased you to a certain extent by telling you about these weird and wonderful possibilities, but as a practicing solicitor, I must say that 
I get much more comfort when my application is being brought pursuant to the Variation of Trusts Act. And obviously this is the primary method by which trusts are varied in Ontario today. For discussion purposes, I have divided my topic into two parts. The first part deals with the jurisdiction of the court, and the second part deals with the practice on such applications in Ontario. I think it might be useful if you looked at the, the Act itself for a, a moment, which has been reproduced in your materials. I start with the premise that the Act was introduced to provide a means whereby beneficiaries may overcome their inability to use the rule in Saunders and Voce to vary a trust because one or more of the beneficiaries is an infant or otherwise incapable of consenting, is unascertained, has not been born, or the object of discretionary power exercisable after an existing interest terminates. I repeat, the court, by this legislature, legislation, excuse me, is given no power to approve an arrangement on behalf of an adult beneficiary who has a present interest in the trust or a future interest which does not require the exercise of a discretionary power to become vested. Once the court's jurisdiction is understood, and I'll return to that in a moment, it's my belief that there's almost unlimited ability to vary trusts in Ontario using the Variation of Trusts Act. For example, in the, within the last five years, I have been involved in successful applications which have added a power of encroachment to a will, have altered the dispositive provisions in a will with respect to income and capital, have permitted the accumulation of income in an inter vivos trust, have changed the investment powers in a will, have permitted as investments authorized for trustees of both inter vivos trusts and a will, the acquisition of residences for beneficiaries, have authorized the prepayment of secession duty, have authorized the trustees of a will to transfer assets to a corporation in exchange for shares and notes of the corporation as part of an estate freezing scheme, have altered dispositive provisions in a will to eliminate ambiguity, and have changed the provisions in a will dealing with successor trustees. Although I've not been so involved, I've learned of applications which have been successful involving a transfer of assets from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction. It occurs to me that in reviewing the Act and looking at the Court's jurisdiction that there are really two tests that must be met if you're to be successful. The first test is that the Court has discretion to approve the arrangement if it thinks fit. And this test, I believe, will explain a number of decisions that have been reported with respect to the Act, primarily in Great Britain. The second test is that the arrangement must be for the benefit of the first three classes of beneficiaries. And there are several decisions in Ontario dealing with the question of benefit. Now, I return to this element of fitness. It appears to me that in examining whether a variation is fit for its approval, the court has considered, among other things, the attitude of the trustees to the arrangement. Although the court would not be precluded from approving the arrangement, I think if the trustees were opposed to it, I think if they had any basis for their opposition, it's unlikely you would be successful. 
For this reason, I think it important that the trustees approve the arrangement along with the adult beneficiaries. The purpose of the arrangement has also occupied the court when considering fitness. There are several decisions which have stated that, it is, that if its purpose is to avoid taxation, there's no problem. But Professor Skeen, in his lecture, raised another interesting possibility. What if the purpose of the arrangement was to alter the investment powers so as to, for example, permit the trustees to engage investment counsel and furthermore, in order to attempt to limit the trustees' responsibility, you also provided that so long as they acted on the advice of the investment counsel, they could not themselves be personally liable for any breach of trust. Although I'm not aware of any decision, I'm of the view that the court would probably reject such an application on the basis that the purpose was not consistent with the purposes that the court thinks that such applications should fulfill. A third matter which has concerned the court is whether the arrangement contravenes other legislation in Ontario. And this question has been raised in two Ontario cases, a 1969 case dealing with investment powers in which the court found that it would not approve the variation because what was being proposed seemed to be contrary to the Trustee Act as it then was. And then the result was reversed in a 1971 case by the same judge on the basis that the terms of the, invest the Trustee Act which concerned them had been changed in their interval. Finally, and perhaps the most interesting point, which I comment on in more detail in my paper, is the court has continually stressed and looked at the intention of the founder of the trust. There are any number of statements that the arrangement must be within the ambit of the founder's intention. In other words, the trustees may not rewrite the trust document. I question the validity of this attitude. It appears to me that if adult beneficiaries acting together could have terminated a trust or could have varied a trust pursuant to the rule in Saunders and Vautier, and if the only reason that cannot be accomplished is because one or more of the beneficiaries is not capable of consenting, if there's demonstrated to the court that there's a true benefit a significant benefit for those persons who I refer to as the court's clients, why should the court be interested or concerned about the testator or settler's intention? I can refer you to an English decision which is quite interesting. It doesn't prove very much, but it, it proves that you can, in a paper like this, prove or disprove almost anything. The English decision is based on a forfeiture clause in a will which would have had the effect of forfeiting a beneficiary's interest if at the time he took his interest, which I believe was age 30, he was a practicing Roman Catholic. Now what could be more specific in terms of the intent of the testator? He did not wish that beneficiary to receive any interest in his estate if he was a practicing Roman Catholic. The court had no difficulty in approving the arrangement and furthermore, it acknowledged that in so doing, it was defeating the testator's intention. Nevertheless, in the re-Irving decision in Ontario in I think 1976, the Ontario court has clearly indicated that you cannot ignore the founder's intention. For this reason, I suggest to you as a matter of practice that where you're dealing with an inter vivos trust and you have a living settlor, it's most important that the settlor be a party to the arrangement, that he, his or her consent be filed with the court. So the question of intention should not be raised. I now turn to the second requirement, that is that the arrangement be beneficial for those who I refer to as the court's clients. 
It's clear that the benefit need not be financial, but it may include non-financial matters such as a means of eliminating a source of tension or dissension, rather, among members of a family. It's clear that the perceived benefit may be coupled with some form of risk. In other words, it's not absolutely necessary that the benefit you've identified be a guaranteed one. If, on some remote possibility, because of deaths occurring in an unusual order, the benefit would not arise, then the court, I believe, would still be prepared in proper circumstances to accept that it was, in fact, a, a real benefit. Although I find little support in the cases, it appears to me that the court has frequently been working on this premise because on most of the arrangements or variations which involve tax savings, there's a built-in assumption which is never stated that the tax laws will remain constant. Surely, whenever you, the purpose of an arrangement is to take advantage of tax laws, there's always the possibility that the purpose will not be served because of a change in tax legislation or, as we'll see in a moment, because of a, a new assessing practice by Revenue Canada. The court has recognized that most arrangements involve a process of bargaining and consequently the court is prepared to accept benefits which involve both detriment to its clients and benefit if on the balance there's a substantial benefit. So it doesn't have to be a single one-way street. Some changes could be detrimental if others were of substantial benefit. And finally, something that's often forgotten is that the court's responsibility under the Act is to show or to find a benefit for each of its clients individually, not collectively, but individually. And where this creates a problem for you is if you have, say, two classes of beneficiaries, one class having a very definite interest and the second class having a remote <coughs> contingent interest, I suggest to you that it's quite possible that if you ignore the class with the remote interest on the theory that they're, it's highly unlikely they will ever receive any benefit from the estate, and if there are among that class beneficiaries who are the court's clients, then you must provide some form of benefit for those beneficiaries as well. Now, I turn to an examination of the practice in Ontario, and for that purpose I'd like to very briefly refer, to you, refer you to the precedents or forms that I've included in my materials. I can probably go on for some time to discuss bargaining processes and other matters which take place during the course of a successful variation of trust application, but what I would say to you probably would not be of much assistance because each one is different. What I will say though is that it's been my experience that once you've identified the need for a change, once you've satisfied yourself that the best method of accomplishing the change is by means of an application under the variation of trust legislation, that before involving all the necessary parties, you sit down, you get a plan. The plan takes into account the necessity of providing true benefits for those people who are the court's clients, at that point, you then involve all remaining adult beneficiaries. You get some form of preliminary consensus to your plan, and then you approach the official guardian. At that point, I suggest to you most strongly that you not have an arrangement in existence, in other words, a document, but rather you have your plan. It's been my experience that the official guardian or his solicitors approach these questions with an open mind that if you can demonstrate to their satisfaction that their beneficiaries 
will receive a meaningful benefit from your proposal. They will cooperate to the utmost. In fact, you may find that by reason of their extensive experience, they can suggest improvements to your plan, which in no way will act to the detriment of your clients, but rather will improve their position. After you have satisfied the official guardian, and I recognize in saying that it's not mandatory that you have his agreement or endorsement of your proposal, you could proceed without it, but I doubt very much that you would be successful in your application. Then, at that point, you commence to draft your arrangement. And I have given you a form of arrangement which is, I think, in a different form than that which has been published to date. We've used this arrangement for a number of occasions. And the premise upon which it's been prepared is that an arrangement is not an agreement. It's not a deed. It's not an agreement between parties. But rather, it's a proposal consented to by certain beneficiaries, perhaps by the trustees, and then submitted to the court for approval. And that, therefore, it doesn't have to have parties. And to put it into the context of having parties is probably misleading. Furthermore, there could be applications in which there would be no person who was capable of signing the arrangement itself because there are no adult beneficiaries. There are only unborn infant beneficiaries, and therefore, the application probably would be brought by the trustees, but there would be no other parties to the arrangement. You'll see that it's been set up in such a way that it's subject to the approvals and consents of the beneficiaries who are capable of giving those consents, subject to the approval and consent of the trustees for the reason I've explained already. It's conditional upon the court approving this arrangement or some variation of it. And of course, I've included reference to the possibility of costs being awarded, chargeable to the estate and paid out of the estate. And finally, although it may not be appropriate in, in many cases, there's a counterpart pr provision which I've found useful when you have a number of beneficiaries who must sign the arrangement. Attached is a consent by the trustees, an affidavit of execution. I provided you with a, a notice of motion. You'll see that the application is brought for a judge of the Supreme Court under pursuant to the Variation of Trusts Act that And, the, and Rule 607. Rule 607 requires that notice be served on the official guardian in all applications and also be served on those persons whose rights or interests are sought to be affected. The rule makes no reference to serving trustees, but I, as I've stated, I think that's appropriate if they're not the applicants. And then finally, I turn to the order. Looking at page th two of the order, I see, uh, I point out to you that the court firstly appoints the official guardian to act on behalf of infants unborn and unascertained, and that appointment is made pursuant to Rule 78. The second paragraph states the court's approval of the arrangement, and you'll note that the arrangement is attached as part of the order and forms part of the order. Now, it's not in this particular form, but it is in one set of published forms, a third paragraph which directs the official guardian to indicate his consent by affixing his signature to the arrangement. I could find no statutory or other authority for that practice. I've been informed by a solicitor at the official guardian's office that there is, to his knowledge, no such authority, and that this type of order without that clause is being accepted and, in fact, is, is being encouraged at this time in order to not require that the official guardian also endorse the arrangement which forms part of the order. 
The third paragraph will only be used in circumstances where you're varying a will and where the will is the subject matter of a grant from a surrogate court. And finally, I deal with the question of costs, important to us all. And I bring to your attention that in addition to costs of the application, we've made it as clear as we could that we're asking for costs with res that are incidental to the negotiation and settlement of the arrangement. You may wish to take a moment to delete the yes, which appears at the end of the second last line on page two of the order. Now, in the time that, that remains to me, I'd just like to make a few very, very brief comments on charitable trust because I think there are some special problems there. Firstly, there is judicial authority to the effect that the rule in Saunders and Voce applies to charitable trusts. This means that if you have a, a trust which has as its beneficiaries both private individuals and a charity, then assuming that the interests are such that you can use the rule, the charity can join in that particular use of the rule and can vary the trust. However, if your charity is the sole beneficiary of a trust which is intended to continue in perpetuity, the usual type of trust being one which provides that the charity shall receive all of the income but has no access to the capital, there's also authority for the proposition that the rule cannot be used by the charity to defeat the trust and thereby accumulate the capital, receive the capital. The theory behind this is that the charity's interest in those circumstances is not absolutely vested. There's always a possibility that at some time the charity will cease to exist and in that case the court would cause the trust fund that remains to be applied for another purpose so that no charity proceeding on that basis can ever state that it has the sole and only absolute interest in the trust. From time to time, the Variation of Trust Act has been used to vary charitable trusts. Today, I, I have used it once. Today, I'm a very humble man. Professor Cullody told me I couldn't do it. I told him I did. I find that I shouldn't have. <laughs> that it's being, it, it's clear and I accept this that if one examines the nature of the legislation, the persons referred to on whose behalf the court is acting are really those who are incapable of giving any form of consent. The charity is capable of giving a consent. Furthermore, pursuant to, the, to um, the procedure that's required, the official guardian must be given notice of all applications and it's inconsistent in a totally charitable trust for the official guardian to be interested. So it's now thought, and there's a 1977 Ontario case which will assist you, that the better procedure is to apply to the court to exercise its inherent jurisdiction to deal with the affairs of charities. And this is an application which is quite different or apart from a Cypre application. You've all heard of Cypre applications. That's what you do when the purpose of the trust becomes impossible or impracticable. We're not talking about that sort of situation. I'm talking about the possibility that you might wish to vary a charitable trust to perhaps improve the investment powers to authorize the sale of a specific asset which the trust directs be held in perpetuity, then what you would do is you would make an application asking the court to exercise its inherent jurisdiction on behalf of charities. Now, the last topic on my material refers to income tax. I suspect you'll get your fill of income tax tomorrow, but I I think I must warn you, because I think it's not being appreciated, that there's one recent Tax Review Board decision, Re Murphy, which has clearly called into practice or into question the practice of varying trust solely for the purpose of 
creating certain tax advantages. I am also familiar with a series of other assessments, notices of reassessments that have been issued by Revenue Canada in similar fact situations. So I have no doubt that if you're trying to do a variation of the sort that's set out in Re Murphy, you are inviting a problem. What happened, very simply stated there, is the trust provided that the income must be paid to a single beneficiary. The trust was varied so that it was beneficiaries were added, they, they had discretionary rights to income, and then, of course, the trustees proceeded to divide the income or sprinkle the income in the future among the beneficiaries. An excellent result, if you can sustain it. Unfortunately, Mr. Murphy, although he enjoyed what I would think was a tax break from 1967 till 1973, lost with respect to reassessments in 74, 75, and 76. I haven't time to, to go into the basis for that, but I warn you that that's a possibility. I also warn you that there are other possibilities that you must consider from a tax standpoint where your variation has the effect of changing capital or income interest as opposed to dealing with administrative or management, or, or management matters. Could it be said that by reason of the variation, there's a deemed disposition of the trust assets? Could it be said that by reason of the variation and the consent by the beneficiaries to the variation, they have in some way realized on their capital or income interests in the trust? If this occurs, then you will find that there very well may be unintended or adverse tax results. It's even possible to make a hypothetical case that the trustees, by consenting to the arrangement, have in some way conferred a benefit and have created a, a liability on the estate itself, pursuant to subsection 56.2. It is possible, in my experience, to obtain advanced income tax rulings, which will clarify at least some of the tax consequences of a proposed variation. Whether it's appropriate to do so, where the principal reason for the variation is to save tax, I leave to you to decide. Now, I, I conclude simply by stating that I hope I've convinced you that virtually any trust may be amended, regardless of its terms, and I've given you some ideas on how such amendments might be accomplished.